Hello, my name is Claire Gwyn Lewis, and in 2017, my second volume of prose, Fabula, was published by Alulva. Um, Fabula is a collection of eight pieces that might loosely be called stories. They could also maybe be seen as fragments of sorts. And they're loosely connected by the motif of the Fabula Zolikoferi moth that appears on the cover. Um, and it also appears in some form in each of the stories as well. And the stories themselves flit, much like the moth itself, from place to place and also from time to time. From Argentina to Japan to Barcelona to the mythical lost kingdom of Cantra Gwilod in Cardigan Bay to pirates and wreckers on the Glamorganshire coast to a future version of Cardiff, where I live now, and to Dublin during the Eastern Rising. So the time periods of these stories range then from the present to the medieval past um, and onwards to an imagined sort of future. And it's also hopefully a sort of journey in language as the style and the register of each story varies according to the narrator. So although the stories are connected in some sense, I also wanted them to be fairly disparate so that I could explore the layered meanings and possibilities of stories in order to try and reflect the complexities of personal and cultural identity in a changing world. I also wanted to try to situate these stories at the boundary between truth, fiction, history, reality and the entirely fabulous between story and history in a sense. And on top of this, I was also trying to explore the unsettling experiences that can be brought on by the act of travelling, by the act of, of movement through various places and landscapes, of experiencing different places in the world through the eyes of the various characters uh, in the book. So I was very keen to look outwards into the world um, in this book, but always with one eye on how specifically this experience might play out from a Welsh and specifically a Welsh language um, perspective, um, because Welsh speakers um, are a minority in many ways, even within their own geographical boundaries. And yet the Welsh language culture is one that often seeks to place itself within a dominant European uh, Western tradition. So I wanted to see how those things could, could play out against each other. So of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, literary uh, play going on in the book, subversion, a desire constantly to challenge the reader, uh, to interrogate and question what's being presented to them through the stories. But I really hope as well that the stories can also work on a much simpler and more human emotional level and that the characters, ranging from a female Welsh missionary in Meiji Restoration Era Kyoto to the young revolutionaries of the Cardiff of the future who are all named after characters in the map in Okeon, that they're all interesting and engaging enough and elicit an empathetic response from the reader in their journeys and in their stories. And I'd also hope that there's a fair amount of wry humour in the book. It was certainly a book that was a lot of fun to write uh, and to play with, and I'd be disappointed if some of that didn't then come to the surface and come to the fore um, to the reader as well as you read. Um, I think that I should read maybe an extract to you from the book, and it comes from the final story in the collection. This story is centred on the mythical kingdom of Cantrer Gwilod, um, supposedly a kingdom that was drowned and is now situated beneath the waves of Cardigan Bay. And they say that if you listen closely at night, you can still hear the bells ringing um, beneath the waves. And it's a much explored fable in Welsh culture, almost uh, exhaustively so. So I thought that if I was going to approach it at all, I wanted to do so from a slightly different angle. So in this piece, um, which is ostensibly um, written as an academic footnote of sorts by a researcher, Dr. Mareri Dries at Aberystwyth University's Marine Architecture Department, a completely fictional department, the fabled remains have finally been discovered by her, but have transpired to be of quite a different structure than had previously been commonly imagined. So Dr. Reese's findings lead to a meditation on the emphasis, sometimes altogether too strong 
uh, especially in Wales, that a culture might place on its past, on remembrance and commemoration, and of course on memory itself. So by the end of the story, we begin to suspect that this meditation also carries profound personal significance to Dr. Rees herself, but I won't reach that part today. You'll have to go and seek out the uh, story yourself, which is available on the Welsh Literature Exchange website uh, at the moment. And the piece has been wonderfully translated by Katie Gramich, so my thanks go to her for this uh, uh, this piece in English. I'll read a few um, sentences to you from the middle of the story in Welsh first, and then a longer extract uh, in English. Rhyn weddau anghofrwydd. Ail gyd destinoli olion archeolegol mae sgwydno. The virtues of forgetfulness, recontextualizing the archaeological remains of mae sgwydno. Yn ystod y daith, bym yn myfyrion ddwys ar yr hyn yr oedd yn wedi ddarllen. O Gymryd y cofnod fel gwirionedd, ac o gan fod sestiolaeth o'r iwbath i'w gefnogi, byddai ein deallwriaeth o holl ddiwylliant cantrid gwylod, ac yn wir Gymru yr oesoedd canol yn newid yn sylfaenol. Mae dylai esam ein cred i'r hoddid bri i mawr gan Gymru yr oesoedd canol ar bethau fel chwedleia, ac ar dros treion, ac ar dros glwyddiad llafar ar gof y chwedlau hynny, dros genedlaethau. On the journey out to sea, I mulled over carefully what I'd read. If the record were taken as true, and if evidence of some kind were found to back it up, our understanding of the entire culture of Cantred Gwaelod and, indeed, medieval Wales would be fundamentally altered. I thought about our belief that medieval Welsh people laid great store by things like folk tales and storytelling and on the oral transmission of those remembered tales over generations. I remember too the whole system of Cynghaned which, according to some, had been devised and shaped in order to make it easier for people to remember what they had composed, so that the poetry could be learned by heart and passed on. Musing on the subject, on the genealogy and the family trees, and on the memory of Irian and Maelgun, and all the tribes of the Old North that were gathered in the distant twilight of the Welsh people's memory, the realisation struck me that our relationship as Welsh people with memory and with remembering bordered on the obsessive. So why did it appear that one tribe or one community was completely different and so contemptuous of memory that they did not know their own family histories? When I reached the most southerly point of the arc of the area indicating 70,000 cubits from the mouth of the Rheidol River in Aberystwyth, I dropped anchor and set about preparing the hydroacoustic equipment which would enable me to search the ocean floor for the remains of my squidno. I spent half an hour there alone before the first readings appeared on the screen. I soon realised that it would take some time to navigate the entire arc and search the whole area. Although I had not slept much the previous night, I was full of an energy and hope that I had not felt for many months. I succeeded in covering a distance of some miles in the course of the day before being forced to head back to shore. By the time I had done that, it was getting dark, and before I had reached the beach, night had fallen like a wave over the town. I could see the little green and red lights gleaming on the wooden legs of the pier. Though I hadn't found anything that day, I remembered how good this was. Being able to leave the paperwork and the desk and the lecture room behind, to be out in the open air, immersed in fieldwork, searching and finding and questioning. It was for this that I dropped into this world 30 years and more ago. I listened to the low purring of the engine, puttering and opening a dark trace in the blackness behind me, and then the big open sea beyond. I could hear, softly at first, and then more clearly as I approached the small waves breaking on the beach, and beyond them a few cars on the prom, and voices overflowing out of the occasional pub and cafe on the seafront. Out here, despite the light crosswind that wound itself around my boat, it was as if every sound from the shore had been magnified as it was carried towards me in the breeze. Constitution Hill rose in utter darkness on the left of the town, but the lights of the hotels already shone brightly, and other lights were beginning to come on, and I thought about the different lives that existed that night on the land, 
about how some of them touched and interlaced with others, while some of them never came together at all. All these lights made me think of my own life, the lives that had touched mine before sailing away as if upon a dark sea. I was alarmed to realise that the only man in my life these days was poor old Professor Fratelli. Where on earth had the others gone, that chemistry student I went about with? Adrian, in the early days of my doctorate, before my hunger to finish and the urge to write got the better of me? Or Peter, the quiet lawyer who grew tired of waiting in the cafes and pubs of the town for the light in my office to go out at the end of the day, and who put out his own candle in due course? Davith, the first one, who was from the same village as me. I sat there and felt a kind of emptiness because I'd let these men slip through my fingers. And yet, if I were being honest with myself, I did not feel any great regret or sadness either as I sat there by myself on board the Prudwen, listening to the lapping of the water on the boat sides and watching the lights of Aberystwyth come on one by one. Unfortunately, Days went by before I was able to turn my attention to this marginal but very exciting research once more. There was no time to go out with Prudwen to continue the work. But when I got half an hour to myself, I started to make it a habit to climb up Consty Hill at about 5.30, after it had grown dark, in order to try to recreate that experience of holding the whole of Aber in the palm of my hand. On one of these peregrinations, I took a little booklet with me, once again borrowed from the departmental library, namely... Legends and Folk Tales of Cardigan Bay by R. Gwynegon Davis, Treardir, 1943. And in the faint light of my phone, I came to realise that there were several different versions of the Cantreguilad story. According to one story in the book, the person responsible for the drowning of my squidmo was a priestess who, through neglect, allowed water from the fairy's well to overflow. Another version of the story has the figure of Sethenin, as the king of a neighbouring community who comes to visit Cantreguilad. He seduces the gatekeeper, Mererid, who goes to bed with him, leaving the great doors open and the town undefended. Then the last version I read was the one I was most familiar with, namely that Gwydnogaran here, the king of Cantreguilad, who lived in Maesquidno, had held a magnificent feast, that Maesquidno and the whole community was defended by a series of sea walls and floodgates which someone had to be responsible for opening and closing according to the state of the tide, and that Sethenin was the person responsible for them on the night of the feast. Sethenin was irresponsible, got drunk in the feast, falling asleep and forgetting his duties, and the water flooded in while everyone slept after their revelry. The entire community and its inhabitants were drowned. As I read this story, I was struck by how detailed the descriptions of the floodgates and sea embankments were. There must have been an extensive and complicated series of them, one after the other, and it must have taken considerable ingenuity and perseverance, firstly to build them, and then to defend them and keep them working. I suddenly felt a great admiration for those ancient engineers who had designed and built such a system, and of course, it was said that the land of Cantreguilod was so fertile and fruitful that one acre of it was worth as much as four acres anywhere else, and so it was worth defending it so thoroughly. Now, I had a reasonable sense of the shape and size of what I was looking for. Laboriously, in the one light of the phone, telling myself off for doing something as stupid as to climb constantly at night to read a book, I made a hasty sketch of the defences, as described in the work of the worthy Mr Davis. As I looked at the defences, they looked rather terrifying, and certainly they would have seemed so to anyone arriving at Cantreguilod from the direction of the sea. For some reason, I thought that they resembled, in a symbolic sense, the way in which the mind sometimes constructs defences for itself to prevent memory, or to pre prevent the remembering of appalling or traumatic events from the past, to stop the flow of memories. Embankments are built and gates are shut. Barrier after barrier is erected, one after the other, until if we began inadvertently to think about this or that or something that happened, the memory would shut its gates, would devise some ruse or play some trick to lead us along a different path. Only when we were drunk or had lost control of those gates, 
Only then would it all come flooding back, and would drown us, perhaps.